All right, so part two, what I'm going to do is just give a bit of a refresher on the three lemmas we just proved and what do they give us. So lemma one told us this under no assumptions. Uh, well, okay, I have to quantify everything, but under no assumptions, you will have that the subset of A where the probability, uh, where the oscillation is larger than T is controlled by the measure of oscillation divided by t to the power q times the probability of a. It's for all t greater than zero, that's important. And it's for all a and ak, and for all k and n with k less than or equal to n. That's lemma one. We get that unconditionally. We just, we get this. Lemma two, says that if you have an estimate of this form with a certain constant c, then you have a corresponding estimate for general stopping times with constant 2c. And now lemma 2 will imply, using lemma 1, that we have this. So I have f sub t instead of f sub n. That's a generalization to stopping times. Now we have 2t. This will be less than or equal to 2 times the constant from the first lemma times probability of a. Now this is also for all t greater than 0 because lemma 2 says if you've got the estimate of lemma 1 with some constant for some t, you get the corresponding estimate for 2t with 2 times that constant. So we have a 2t here and we have a two here. So that's for all t, for all a and a k, for all stopping times t such that t is greater than or equal to k on a, all right? That's what lemma two gives us given lemma one, all right? And lemma three, given lemma one and lemma two, because all of these are a chain of lemmas, you take the output of lemma one, you know, put that in lemma two, take the output of lemma two, put that in lemma three. Lemma three tells us that the probability that the maximal function of the started process, the process started at k minus one with this horrible notation, the size of this super level set is controlled by two times the constant from before. So this is still this measure of oscillation. times the measure of a different super level set. This is just S here. Yeah? Now this is still for all T greater than zero because lemma three says, okay, if this holds for some T, if lemma two holds for some T, then lemma three holds for that same T and for all S. So lemma one's for all T. So now this is also for all T, for all K. I should have said for all K and N here. T, S, K, and A. All right, so this is where we are now. And when I was doing lemma two and three, I phrased all of this in terms of a constant C, small c. I call it small c because I wanted to think of it of C as being a small constant. Now there's nothing saying that this constant here has to be small. It can be quite large, right? But if we make the assumption a priori that this measure of oscillation is finite, at least, then if we take t to be very large, this constant is small. And that's what we have to exploit later on. Now, the kind of control we get in lemma three of these, of super level sets of this function, maximal function of the started process, this kind of level set control actually gives you LP estimates for every p of a certain kind depending of course on the constant that you've got here. And this constant becomes particularly interesting. And that's gonna be lemma four. And lemma four, I'm gonna state for general functions on general measure spaces because it has nothing to do with stochastic processes at all. It's just a statement about non-negative real functions. So we take a measure space now. The 
measure space and we have a real value function f. Um, not only is it real, it's non-negative and measurable. And we assume that f is supported in a set A of finite measure. We're going to be working on probability spaces, so everything has finite measure. That's not going to be a problem. But for the general result, we need the function to be supported on a finite measure set. We suppose that there exists t greater than 0 and a constant c between 0 and 1, such that the super level measure of s at scale s plus t is less than or equal to c times the super level measure of f greater than s. And suppose this is true for all s. So this is the kind of, a, of estimate that we get in lemma three. Then for all p greater than or equal to one, less than infinity, you have that the LP norm of f is less than or equal to 1 plus c to the 1 on p divided by 1 minus c to the 1 on p times t times the measure of this support to the 1 on p. So starting with this kind of super level set measure comparison, if you have this constant c being small enough so that you actually do get a geometric decay of these super level measures, then you will get LP control with this constant depending on c. And the smaller c is, the, the smaller this constant is. So you can see here that as c approaches one, this denominator, you know, it blows up. You get a zero at the denominator, your constant becomes infinity. So that's why c has to be less than one. That is at least formally why c has to be less than one. If c were greater than one, you wouldn't be getting geometric decay, you'd actually be getting nothing. All right. Actually, yeah, I should point out, if you have this got this with constant c equals one is always true because the set on the left is contained in the set on the right. So of course its measure is smaller than the measure on the right hand side. What you want is that it's much smaller. Yeah. So the proof, uh, we're going to assume that f actually already has finite LP norm. The reduction to this case is a bit annoying, but it's true. It's also not very interesting. So in the notes, I think even in the notes, I'll just say it's not interesting <laughs> and I don't do it, but you can reduce this to, to the case where F is actually in LP. So we'll assume F's in LP, but we don't assume any control on the LP norm. We start with the purely qualitative statement that F's in LP and we're gonna get the quantitative statement from that. So we want to control the LP norm. So let's take the P power of that and write it in this representation that I've used before in terms of an integral of super level measures. And I remember the first time I did this, I said, I assume you've all seen it, but not everybody had seen it. Now you've all seen it. Great. So let's write this as an integral from zero to T. We have this T that we're given. Uh, less than or equal to. So for s less than t, let's just say that the measure where f is greater than s is less than the measure of a, the measure of the set where f supported. And we don't do anything more smart than that. But the integral from t to infinity, we're going to control differently. We're going to write that as an integral from zero to infinity of s plus t, doing a change of variables. times the super level measure that we have control on. What can we say about that? This first integral, we can actually just evaluate directly. We get T to the P measure of A, standard calculus. And here, let's use the estimate that we assumed. 
So we have this constant C and the super level measure F greater than S instead of S plus T. So just going from here to there, that's the assumption. Now, what can we do from there? Let's do nothing to this first term, keep it as is. Keep these terms here, keep the C. And we write the measure of the set where F is greater than S as the measure of the set where F plus T times the indicator function of the support set A is greater than S plus T DS. So if you're away from A, this is just saying that, well, F is zero, so nothing happens. And if you're on A, then you can say, well, F greater than S is the same as F plus T is greater than S plus T. But you only do that on A, the set where, S, where F is supported. So now what we have here is this clever representation of an LP norm, because now we have S plus T, S plus T. Have I written this properly? Yep. So just to write in one extra step that's not in my notes, let's write this as the integral from uh, t to infinity of p s p minus one measure f plus t indicator of a greater than s ds. Is that right? Yep, that's right. So we have this representation of an LP norm, but we've cut it off at t. So in particular, that's less than or equal to the integral from zero to infinity, <laughs> just to be something very trivial. So what we get is the LP norm of f plus t indicator of a to the p. And what this gives us, taking the one on pth power, throughout LP norm of F is less than or equal to T times mu of A to the one on P plus, did I forget my C here? Yes, I did. Uh, C to the one on P F plus T indicator of A LP norm. This is what happens when you take one on P powers one on p power of a plus b is less than or equal to a to the one on p plus b to the one on p. And this by the triangle inequality is less than or equal to this here. Uh, T mu a one on p. Because that's what the LP norm of the, the indicator function is. It's the measure of the support to the one on p. And we see that we have an F, an LP norm of F on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And if we didn't assume this LP norm was finite, we couldn't do anything because we'd have infinity less than infinity. And you do not want to subtract infinity from infinity because that leads to problems. We've assumed that this LP norm is finite, so we can take this over to the left-hand side without issues. And we get that one minus C to the one on P times the LP norm of F and C is less than one. So we're not going to run into any issues here at all. Less than or equal to one plus C to one on P T mu of A one on P. I don't need that bracket. And then we divide by one minus C to the one on P. It's positive because C is less than one. So there's no sign changing going on. And we get exactly what we claimed was true. That was what we claimed was true, wasn't it? Yeah. So that's a nice little proof. If you have this kind of control of super level sets of your function, the super level sets decay geometrically in some sense, then your function's in LP with an LP norm, depending on the rate of decay that you've got. So having proven that, and given what we know about lemmas one, two, and three, we can go to the proof of John Nuremberg. If 
Finally. So where do we start? Lemmas one, two, and three. It gives something that I said before already. I better write it out again. Uh, S plus two T less than or equal to two measure of oscillation divided by T to the Q maximal function greater than S for all T for all S for all K for all A in AK right now let's call this constant C of T this constant from the right hand side here So what we want to do to apply lemma four is we want to make C less than one. I'll just write it out in a slightly different way Two T to the minus Q oscillation to the Q. We have that C of T is less than one when T is greater than two to the one on Q oscillation of F. And I should have been assuming from the beginning, I didn't state it. As in the previous summer, we're going to assume that this measure of oscillation is finite. Otherwise, nothing to show. Exactly, there's nothing to show. I'm going to estimate the LP oscillation by the LQ oscillation. And if the LQ oscillation is infinite, then that estimate says nothing. It just says the LP oscillation is less than infinity. Or equal to so yeah it, it suffices to assume that this oscillation is finite just the qualitative statement as before in particular we can actually choose t to be greater than this because this right hand side is finite so then for such large enough t Lemma four says that, uh, what does it tell us? It tells us that the LP norm of the maximal function of F on the set A is less than or equal to one plus C of T to the one on P divided by one minus C of T to the one on P times T times the probability of A to the one on P. And this is for all P. Now, what you can do at this point, if you want to prove as sharp of an estimate as possible, is you can optimize over t. You can do a little bit of calculus and say, what's the value of t that's going to give me the smallest constant here? Um, I'm not going to try to do that. I'm just going to pick a t that works. It gives an estimate, not the sharpest estimate. I'm not particularly interested in the sharpest estimate. And that said, this technique doesn't give the sharpest estimate anyway. So there's not really a whole lot of proof in optimizing it. We're just going to take t0 to be 2 to the 1 plus 1 on q times this measure of oscillation. I didn't exactly pull that out of nowhere. I pulled that out of having a look at the estimates and seeing what comes out and saying this is the simplest thing I can take that will give an estimate that works. So C of T zero for this particular value of T zero. What is that? That is, here's C of T up here. Two times two to the one plus one on Q. Oscillation of F to the minus Q. And then you get another oscillation of F to the Q. Have I done that right? Yep. And that's why I chose this T zero in this way so that these two terms can cancel out. And I'll just get two to the minus Q, two, two to the minus Q, two to the minus one. Yep. Cool. So we get something that doesn't depend on F or P in particular. Well, it could depend on P, that's okay. But it doesn't depend on F anymore, this constant. 
So where to from here? Let's look at the oscillation of F, but in LP instead of in LQ. Let's look at the thing we wanted to estimate. It's a supremum over K less than N, supremum over A in AK plus of an average over A of Fn minus Fk minus one. LP integral. And this can be controlled by the supremum, all as before, average over A. This difference here can be controlled by the maximal function of the started process. Started at K minus one. because that maximal function is just a supremum over all n of these differences. And you see here that this is independent of n because we took the supremum over all of n to do this control, right? So this n can vanish in the supremum at the front. So supremum over k, supremum over a and a k plus, and let's write this as the probability of A to the minus one on P. We're dividing through by the probability of A in this average. And we have the LP norm of this maximal function. That's right, LP of A. Yep. And that's what we have control over, independent of K. What was the control I had here? We have this estimate up here from lemma four. So we get this probability of A to the one on P cancels out that one. And we simply get that this is less than or equal to one plus C of T zero to the one on P divided by one minus C of T zero to the one on P. And I get, do I get a T here, T zero? Yep. And the probability term is already canceled out. And now we just need to use what T zero and C of T zero actually are. That's one plus two to the minus Q on P divided by one minus two to the minus Q on P and T zero is two to the one plus one on Q times the oscillation of F in LQ. Now I just did I check that C was less than one have I done all that right? Yeah, two, yep, cool. I'm surprisingly bad at math. It took me a minute to realize that this two to the minus Q and P is actually less than one. It is less than one because it's two to the minus something. It's one on a large number, right? It's less than one. So this constant here is, depends on P and Q. It's positive, it's finite, and it doesn't depend on F. And I don't care what it is. So I'm going to write that this is equivalent depending on P and Q to the LQ oscillation of F. That's all we needed to show. That's John Nuremberg. I'll show that the LP oscillation is controlled. Let me write it like this, less sim. The LP oscillation is controlled by the LQ oscillation and P and Q are arbitrary. So I can stop the roles of P and Q, doesn't matter. Actually, because we're doing averages, actually, you, you always have that if P is less than Q, then the LP average is less than the LQ average. So actually that's trivial. The, the hard direction is when P is greater than Q. That's when you actually get a constant that appears that blows up as P and Q approach infinity or whatever. All right, that's John Nirenberg. Just to reiterate, we didn't make any assumptions on X. We didn't make any assumptions on F. No assumptions on the filtration. This is just purely general. Um, and there's not much more to say about that. This is purely just a form and uh, a consequence of the form of oscillation control that we defined. These types of supremum over sets of certain form of LP averages over the thing, they just have a miraculous property that they're actually equivalent in P. 
this is true fairly generally. You get quantities like this that turn out to be equivalent by a John Nirenberg type argument. These, these appear more generally than this. Yeah, I have nothing more to say about that. Are there any questions? Yeah, yeah. So, so you said you have similar arguments like this. Is it always by controlling like these super level sets and then getting this like self and self improvement sort of stuff? Like you, you, you would do like a stopping time. It's, argument? it's always a stopping time argument, basically. Right. Yeah, okay. the the stopping time argument is the crucial thing. I mean, you get stopping time arguments in different forms. A lot of the time in harmonic analysis, you'll get you'll do a stopping time argument, but you won't actually say these are stopping times in the probabilistic sense. You'll just say like, let N be the first scale for which a certain thing is greater than a certain thing. And then you use the properties of that, that minimality of that N say, mm. to get things to work. Like you, this argument that we use at some point that when you have a stopping time with value N, then at N minus one, your function is less than a certain thing. And at N, the function is greater than the certain thing. You exploit that. Yeah, right. You exploit that in many clever ways. Yeah. yeah. So was was that how John slash Nuremberg would have proved this originally when they were looking at? I don't know. Whatever? Does Does yeah. Christoph know? Yeah, yeah. I. I think definitely Nuremberg was a PDE person more than the probabilist. So I, I don't think they did it uh, with the probabilist uh, uh, language. Yeah, I was. Those that went to my course last semester, we, we kept talking about maximal collections of dyadic disjoint dyadic intervals. I believe a maximal, uh, I mean, a collection of maximal dyadic intervals is a stopping time. Basically, right? yeah. Above every x, you choose a scale which interval this x should be living in, and then this interval will not uh, be divided any further into smaller intervals. And then we were proving, yeah. I forgot whether we proved John Nierenberg in my, uh, it's actually Jon Nierenberg, by the way, Sorry. it's Jon who gave the name, but I keep saying it anyway, it's too <laughs> tempting. Uh, I forgot whether we were proving this, but you could certainly, on the real line, you could prove it by picking dyadic intervals. And I would assume that's more what Nierenberg and Jon have done at the time. But I, I haven't seen, I mean, I don't recall the original papers so maybe it was worth looking up maybe i did a quick wikipedia actually before the lecture just to look at like the proper form of like classical your nuremberg which is not this statement at all like it's the statement for bmo functions right because you've got the way that i think of your nuremberg is that you can characterize bmo using lp oscillations for any p but that's of course equivalent to this exponential integrability property which is what's usually or often formulated as what your Nuremberg is. And maybe that was the original form. And what is this? This is like, if you have a ball B, then the, the measure of X in the ball B such that F minus the average of F on B is greater than Lambda. Then what is it? This is less, less than or equal to, or maybe there's a constant, maybe there's no constant, I'm not sure. What is it like E to the minus how does this work? It's minus lambda, and then do you get the BMO norm of f like that, or is f outside the exponential? Something like that, right? That's in the denominator. The, the denominator. Like that. That makes sense because if f is small in BMO, then this exponential decays faster, right? Mm -hmm. As lambda grows. I don't know. I'm not too familiar with this. I, I'm very surprisingly. There's a cube uh, as well. There should be like the, the the volume of a cube in Rn or something. Yeah. But yeah, whatever B is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's normalized, right? Yeah, normalized. Yeah. That's yeah. Something like that. I mean, I I use I BMO think. spaces surprisingly little for a harmonic analyst. I think I must use them the least out of anybody in a harmonic analysis. But, it's a very Trumpian statement to make, is it? I use BMO less than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't remember if that's the official form. I'm going to skip past that in case I'm wrong. But it turns out, whatever the correct form is, turns out to be equivalent to this statement here when you take the dyadic filtration and it, when you take your stochastic process to be the martingale given by a function with respect to the dyadic filtration. Yeah. 
for for lemma four, um, the reduction to finite finite yeah. LP norm functions. Do you just cap it off at some level? Like you some, cap it off. You you truncate your function. You cap it and off, you can and you that, prove that the estimate doesn't depend on the level. Therefore, you can just send and yeah. Well, the the tricky part is to show that it's not it's not too tricky. It's just a bit fiddly. The the fiddly part is to show that your truncation still satisfies the assumptions. Oh right, okay. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think of that. That's the part. If you right. show that your truncate, if f satisfies this, you show that truncations of f still satisfy it with the same constant. It's not hard, but it's one of these like undergrad type computations where it's like if you're not thinking in exactly the right way, you will not get it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. And I yeah, think I spent fifteen minutes on it when I was writing these notes, just checking that it was true because I was not thinking in the right way. <laughs> Ultimately, that's why I didn't write it in the notes because I could have written it. But it's one of these proofs where even if you see the proof, if you're not thinking right, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> so sure, yeah, sure. I, I recommend going and doing it and just banging your head against the wall until you get it. And yeah, it's just it's one of these things. I, I don't think very well with these estimates. Some people do, but I don't. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but yeah, that's the right idea. Truncate, show the estimates uniform in the truncation. Use monotone convergence to finish the proof.